Good morning, Team Healthy. How you guys doing? I've noticed in some of you, a couple of you, Kaz there from London or from England, UK, brand new here to us. I'm glad you're here with the live feed. Um, we uh, th this this is a little bit of a different format. Those of you who are uh, new to our midweek with Dr. C, uh, this is where I take questions that you all have left through the week and then I respond to them. And so I'm counting on you to go ahead and leave me some questions, whether you, if you're in the live chat, you can go ahead and put them on the side here in the uh, the chat section, or if you're watching it by tape, which is frankly where, uh, how most people do it, put your questions underneath in the comment section. And I want to know who you are. I know want, want to know what's going on with you. And then next week, we're going to answer more questions. That's what we do here. And so just know that's the format. And I'm so pleased that you let me be a part of your journey with you. Um, okay, I have been asked uh, just today on the, the live chat to remind you if you're making comments on our uh, chat feed, keep it nice. DRC, dignity, respect, civility. Uh, every now and then we get uh, somebody that comes along and has some snarky comments. And so uh, we have like a 99.6 uh, like rate. And so uh, there most people that, that come on here to our channel are uh, very supportive and encouraging. They're glad to be here. But every now and then we get a stray person that comes through that says, uh, let, let me see if I can muddy up some of the water. And um, yeah, it happens. It's life. But nonetheless, uh, just keep it clean. Okay. Thank you. Um, today, I, I want to focus on the theme that says uh, that we need to know how to rebuild our lives after a narcissist has shown their true colors. Um, okay, this is another one of those. I know I'm going to get some here. Hands up. How many of you had a uh, an impression of a person and you thought, you know, this is somebody that I could get along with, only to find out later on that oh, man, they were not what they purported to be. In other words, they didn't show you their true colors up front. Any of you can relate to that one? Okay, we all have. And one of the things that we can say is that narcissism is not just or not necessarily a pattern that shows itself right up front. In fact, I haven't really come across any statistics. It would be interesting to, <laughs> there's all the thumbs up and hands up and all. Um I haven't come across any uh, statistics about uh, uh, overt versus covert narcissism, but I would strongly suspect that the majority of the narcissism that you deal with is more of the covert variety. Now, sure enough, there are some individuals who are just so out there and they're so full of themselves and it's so obvious and egregious that it doesn't take a whole lot uh, to, uh, in, the, to uh, in the imagination to figure out where they are. But there are some people that they kind of sneak up on you. There are times when you think, well, we can do business together. We can get along. Or I know that we all have our quirks and idiosyncrasies, and I'm going to allow you yours just as I hope you, you would allow me mine. But over time, things just don't play out very well. And you find yourself feeling burned or misunderstood or on the receiving end of treatment that you originally might have thought, this isn't right. I wouldn't even have thought of you to do this. What are you going to do in the aftermath? And so the more aware you are, the more knowledgeable you are about this whole phenomenon of narcissism, then uh, it, it leaves you with a lot of, of emotion that you have to come to terms with. What are we going to do? Oh, by the way, I'm, I'm going to go straight to my first question here, but uh, I do want to remind you, we have our podcast up and running now. Uh, we were waiting on Apple and Google to uh, approve us for their podcast uh, platforms. And so uh, we have a surviving narcissism platform. So those of you who are into the podcasting world, uh, jump over there uh, after this, of course, and uh, and take a look at it and uh, pass, pass along the news to other individuals. We're uh, going to be building up quite a library over there, just as we're doing on YouTube here. Okay, so I'm going to ask the first question here that kind of gets us started with this whole notion about how we respond after a narcissist reveals their true colors. This person says, hey, Dr. C, that would be me. Hello. How does a former narcissist target manage their own paranoia? Uh, in fact, uh, a while back, I put out a video about how narcissists are uh, driven by paranoia, but sometimes we can have paranoia in reverse. When someone is trying to be my friend, I think I could be falling in with another narcissist. And it's true. Uh, you could, it could be the, the case. 
Uh, I'm real social, but I'm super, super careful about who I open up to. What's the difference between being cautious versus being paranoid? Now, this is what I'm talking about when I say uh, you want to be in a sense of recovery. When you've been with narcissistic individuals, and I don't know if this person has had a, a marital situation where it didn't go well, or if they've had friendships where they got burned or they were in a work setting, and it's like, whoo, it was so toxic there. But uh, whatever the situation may be, you move forward and you, you have what I would refer to as psychological scars or psychological woundedness. And you think, am, am I ever going to be able to get over it? And particularly if you're a trusting kind of a person, then you may think, is my own willingness to trust working against me? I don't speaking personally, I like to get along with people. I, I'm an ENFJ. Those of you who are familiar with the Myers-Briggs, that, that, that extrovert in me says, sure, I'll, I'll be glad to talk with you and I can hold the conversation well with just about anybody. But over time, uh, if you're the kind of person that likes to extend yourself, you begin recognizing there are some people who don't have that reciprocal intention. There are individuals, the narcissists, who are engaging with you not so much because they want to know you through and through and, and exchange in a loving or a supportive or encouraging way. They're looking for supply. And sometimes uh, it, it doesn't uh, show itself until down the road. And so once you realize that's what happened in a former relationship with mine, are you being paranoid when you say, I need to be cautious, I need to be careful. Now, the, the difference between caution and paranoia is paranoia is not grounded in reality, okay? Uh, caution is if it's managed, uh, if it's um, you know something that uh, is inside the normal uh, way of engaging with people. Uh, I, I'm going to give you an illustration, and uh, this this lady, I kind of burst her bubble, but she was you know, 40 ish. She wasn't a uh, spring chicken, and she was talking. She uh, never married, but uh, she all she um, actually, as I got to know her, began realizing that she's into limerence. You know what that is? They're they're in love with being in love. Okay. And she was one of these kind of people, but she was telling me about how she uh, had met a guy and they uh, had a conversation. They wound up uh, sitting at a patio area. Uh, and she said, you know, we, we were just going to have dinner and that was going to be it. But we wound up sitting up till three o'clock in the morning. And I, he told me everything about himself and I told him everything about myself. And it was just absolutely wonderful. And I, I wasn't as, as enthusiastic as she wanted me to be in my response because I knew her well enough to know that she'd been burned and had been burned badly a couple of other times. And my response was something to the effect of, uh, my response was something to the effect of, well, I hope it works out. And this is something that uh, is going to take time to unfold. And she, I, she's ready to say, let's, let's go get them right now. There are times when opening up is not necessarily a smart thing to do. Now, I think it's fine to say as I get to know people and as I uh, reestablish myself in whatever circles I'm in, yeah, I, I want to ask probing questions and they, they don't have to be nosy, but it's just like, I want to know who you are and how you think and what your position is on this versus that. And I'll share with you mine. But I think we want to do, uh, do so without just feeling like we're going all in from day one and it's just going to be, this is going to be it. People uh, uh, require time to reveal themselves to you and narcissists, unfortunately, are schemers. They know how to play the game. One of the defining features actually of narcissism is they have the ability to make a favorable positive impression and it's, it can stay that, that way for a while. Now, it doesn't always stay that way forever. And that's what we need to be aware of. Now, I'm going to go straight into another question. And this person says, after going through an awful divorce with a narcissist, I'm dating. And I want a fresh start with someone new, but I feel very hesitant. Sim similar to the first question. What is a small test question? or action I can uh, take if I ever trust dating again to be, uh, to build my accurate view of this person or accurate view if this person is authentic or just another great pretender. 
So this person is saying, is there any kind of question that I can ask somebody to determine if I'm dealing with a narcissist or if I'm dealing with a poser? Um, now, there's no fail-proof question because some narcissists can still be very good at the game and they can uh, take your legitimate questions and, um, and you know, seemingly give a good answer. But one of the things I like to do, and, and you don't have to do this in the first five minutes that you meet somebody, but I like to eventually ask somebody, tell me about the ways that you've struggled and how your disappointments have impacted you. Um, whenever some, she's talking about divorce, whenever you have been through a divorce and let's say the other person has been through a divorce, uh, there's not a lot of really wonderful ex spouses running around out there. So it, it doesn't surprise me if someone is going to say something about, you know, my ex did this and it was really awful and I tried to do this and it didn't work. And so that was a miserable excuse of a human being. Okay. I get it. People say stuff like that. But what I'm going to want to know is, okay, I, let's establish that ex was not a good person. But eventually it might be something about, well, I know that some of the things uh, on your side of the equation may not have been ideal. What are some of the things that you learned about yourself? And what are some of the things that, uh, that you know that you need to adjust as you move forward? I think those are good kind of questions. Or you can actually take it in a situation if it's a work setting. You know, what was it about that setting that, uh, that now uh, that you've been through it has made you more pensive or more thoughtful? Ask those kind of questions. Now, there typically are going to be two different kind of responses that people will give to a question like that. One is they'll start blaming. Uh, they'll, they'll talk about what they've learned, but actually it's more of a, uh, of a complaint section. For example, a person may say, well, I've learned never to get involved with someone like this, or I've learned that people are liars. I've learned that, uh, that you just can't trust folks. Or I've learned that, you know, you know, uh, I need to take more care of my money because that person ran away with my money. And you, you begin realizing, okay, you're, you're talking about what you've learned, but it's still external there's a different way that you can respond that uh, helps you know that you're going in a direction, uh, in another direction. And if you ask the question, what have you learned? And if a person gives you this more different kind of style, then you may be onto something. If a person says, I've learned that I have some anger issues that I didn't know were on the inside of me. Okay. That's, a, that's an honest answer. And it's typically an answer that a narcissist won't come up with. Or if, if that person says, I've learned that, uh, that I, sometimes want so badly to have a good relationship that I trust too quickly, or I've learned that, uh, that, that I have my own defenses and, and I need to be careful about that. In other words, uh, when they begin focusing on the fact that, you know, that other person, yes, they have their deficiencies, but I have mine too. And when they're able to be honest about it and when they're able to be specific in particular, it's like, okay, we may be going somewhere with this. So when you ask, how can you recover after a narcissist has shown their true colors and now you're moving on and you're with somebody else, uh, let's make sure that we understand that um, self-disclosure doesn't have to just consist of fool's gold. Uh, typically, narcissists will self-disclose as a complaint. I didn't like the way that person did it. Uh, but you can uh, healthy individuals can self-disclose as a means of uh, revealing their own personal vulnerabilities and honesty. And, and uh, narcissists tend not to do vulnerability well at all. They're just blamers and schemers. Okay. Uh, well, this uh, takes us right to our, our next question. And that is, how do you handle a narcissist blame shifting? Okay, so you've been through a relationship, it didn't go real well, and now you're trying to, uh, to uh, work it out with somebody else, and the narcissist is over there, and they're constantly thinking, yeah, there's a, there's a relationship problem between you and me, and then they continue to say it's because of that person, or maybe I had a bad history, or I was caught up in a bad set of circumstances, or you did this, and a, a narcissist is going to constantly be looking out there to determine or to explain why the stuff in here didn't go well. And so the question is, how do you handle that? Why don't we start by an answering that question backwards? How do you not handle it? When you make it your job to try to force that person to be really honest and really insightful about themselves, 
it's not going to go well. Now, you may just throw out a lob towards that other person, and you may say, well, I know that that person disappointed you, um, but tell me about you. And, and when a narcissist just keeps going back to the blame shifting, they're constantly the victim. It's like, this is not a good sign. And that's when you realize I, I'm going to need to be very particular. I'm going to need to be very uh, judicious and uh, careful in the people that I share myself with, because I don't want to be uh, dealing with somebody where I'm going to be the next person they're going to do the blame shifting on. Um, each person needs to take responsibility for himself or herself. And that's what I'm going to be looking for in other individuals. And as I recover from some of my less than wonderful experiences, I need to be that kind of person too. Yes, I'm going to say that person was difficult, but also I need to ask, what did I learn about me? And what did I uh, learn that I can take on down the road? And uh, uh, one of the biggest things we're going to say is uh, uh, you want to be very slow in building other relationships. Uh, you want to uh, to be careful that you don't put so much of your happiness and your well-being into the hands of someone else that you wind up getting caught in some unhealthy codependent dance. And so I hope that you can be that kind of person that says, I'm not into blame shifting. I I'm into introspection and I want to engage with people who are also uh, uh, not blame shifters, but instead are uh, insightful and introspective. And uh, that's something that is just going to take time and you don't feel the need to rush that. Okay. Um, I have, I have another com uh, question here and, and uh, <clears throat> this is of a little bit of a different nature. Now, this person says, how long does it take to get over the hurt from a narcissistic father? How do I handle my enabler mother who wants me to move on and act like the abuse never happened? I've been in, I've been in no contact for about six months. Now, I don't know the person's age here no. but, um, are they 25 years old or 35 years old? Um, but let's suppose that you have uh, an adult now who looks and says, my father was really abusive and I don't want to, to be the kind of person that's required to be an apologist on that person's behalf. Um, uh, I've seen their true colors. I know who they are. I know what they're like, and I don't feel the need to just cower to him anymore. I don't feel the need to, uh, to just let that person bully me. Okay. Good for you. But then mom comes along and let's suppose mom is that consummate enabler or peacemaker. It's like, Oh, don't worry about it. Sometimes he's got his bad days and you don't need to let that get to you. And you're thinking, no, it's not just that simple. It's something more severe than that. How do you deal with uh, that? Because you now see what's going on and she's just kind of doing the blind eye kind of thing. I don't want to see what's going on. Don't make me have to look at it. And I'm not even going to scourge your mother and say, well, she must be some sort of idiot. I, I don't know her. And I don't know what her reasoning is. And it may be that she has too many fears or something. I, uh, so let's just let her be what she is. What we can say, though, is, um, Mom, I know that you don't have the same relationship with Dad as I have with Dad. And so it, sometimes when we are uh, looking at the same person, but from very, very different angles, then we draw different conclusions. And, and just go ahead and say that. And then if she says, yeah, but okay, <laughs> you just, you didn't want to hear what I have to say. Then you stick with your, your, uh, your boundaries. You stick with your stipulations anyway. If there is ever any kind of way that you can see that things would adjust. Okay. Remain open to it. Or if you might have a, a relationship with mom separate from dad. Okay. Remain open to it. But at some point, uh, the way that you recover when you have seen the true colors and those colors are not changing is you hold your, hold your position. And this person has already taken some steps to say, you know, I need to pull back and I need to have much, much less exposure. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to go ahead and go with that. And if somebody says, but I don't get it, then my response to that is I'm aware of that but I'm going to hold to my position anyway, and then trust your own judgment. And frankly, the, uh, the adjustment that has to go with it. Um, now this next one, and, and I've been receiving some comment or some questions along these lines more in the last few months as well. 
This person says, can you comment on how to deal with extremely confusing feelings that come when a narcissistic parent dies? Okay, so let's suppose that this is a person who's 55 years old and they've got an 85 year old parent that has died. And this person is thinking, you know, I, I hate to say that I'm relieved, but I am. And, you know, it, they, I've, I've had many people that have uh, made comments to me along those lines. And, you know, it's, it's nice when someone dies that you can think, I have so many fond memories and there were so many good things that we were able to share. And I, I need to remind myself of what that was all about. But unfortunately, this person is not able to say that. And she says, well, I just have confused feelings because things weren't good between myself and my father. You know, um, it, it, it's a, it serves as an ongoing reminder that says there are just some people that do have insight and some people who don't. And unfortunately, in this person's case, she, she was the daughter of an individual who didn't have good insight. And so I'm hoping that she can take a look at what her experience and her reaction is to her own father and say, you know, one day it's going to be me that has that funeral service and I'm going to be the object of people's focus and attention. What kind of material am I giving them? And so uh, when you uh, have confused feelings with your father, and, and I'm assuming this is not brand new, this has been going on for quite some time, I'm hoping that you can use it as a springboard that says, this is why people need to change and adjust. This is why people could use counseling or could use uh, support groups or could use friends that can help them sift it out. And I'm going to be the kind of person that says, well, if my father, for example, was too, too controlling, how do I want to manage myself as, as a member of that same family tree? Or if my father was too harsh or mean spirited, or if my father was extremely dismissive, or if my father was rageful, okay, that's where he is. And I, and I have the hurt that I have. I can't not necessarily make it go away, but what I can do is I can say today and each day in, in the future, I can do something about me and how I'm going to manage myself and take your hurtful, your painful experiences and uh, turn it into a uh, determination that says I'm going to be the better alternative. And then there's another way that you can manage this. And that is you're not the only person that's had this kind of feeling. I mentioned uh, that I've, I've had quite a few people that have commented on, you know, what do I do when my parent has passed away and I just feel relief more than anything else. There are other people out there that may say, yeah, I may not have had exactly your set of circumstances, but I've had mine too. And ask them, be open, ask probing questions. Um, you know, what were your experiences like and what did, uh, what was it like for you? And you may find that their experiences weren't the same as yours, but you can share. Now, going back to some other comments, you don't want to just pour everything out right, or right away with, uh, with another individual, but be the kind of person that says, I like to be open and I want to know what uh, someone else feels and what they've been through because I know I've been through it. And as much as I can, I want to be the kind of person that says, when you you're with me, uh, let's be, uh, let's be authentic and, and let's let the, uh, the pattern of sharing and connecting build, uh, with the idea that we can encourage each other now to be the better alternative. And when you find yourself using your historical hurt as a way of uh, moving in in a healthy way in your future, then it doesn't make all of the feeling and the hurt go away, but it eases it because it's your way of saying, I now know empathy in ways that I never would have known it before. And that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. So uh, let yourself feel the pain be honest about it, but then also um, don't stay so stuck on it that you don't have the A, I'm going to do something different about myself, and then B, I'm going to seek other individuals who could use my encouragement and support just as I could use theirs. So uh, use it as part of that, part of the growth trajectory, okay? Uh, okay. Now, this, you know, we're again, talking about rebuilding after you see a narcissist true colors, this next one is one that so many of you I know can relate to. Um, this person just asked the question, you've mentioned that a narcissist's capacity for self-reflection 
is close to zero. Saying this, of course, I'm not sure if they even feel pain anyhow. Do they? You know, part of your struggle as you try to recover from some of the difficulties with a narcissist, you look into their way of treating people and you say, that's not the way to do so. Uh, they can be very argumentative or stubborn or uh, just entrenched in their own prejudices or um, highly controlling. And you're over there feeling pain. You're feeling hurt. And then as you've tried to talk with that person, uh, part of your um, uh, realization is they don't talk with insight. And then you, you ask the question, well, do they just not feel pain? And the answer is, oh, yeah, narcissists feel pain. That's why they feel angry. Or narcissists feel pain. That's why they, you know, throw their hands up and say, I can't deal with this anymore. This is ridiculous. And that's why they look for people to, uh, to who are going to admire them. They, they, they want to get rid of the pain. They want to be in a uh, pain-free kind of life. The difference between you feeling pain and a narcissist feeling pain is who takes responsibility for what? Narcissists feel pain, most of them. Now, the, the only exception we'll give really is going to be the uh, uh, the malignant narcissist, the psychopath in particular. They're just impervious to the pain that they generate. They, they just, in fact, part of the defining feature of that is that uh, they uh, they don't feel pain because they, they're so numb to the world in front of them. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, uh, narcissists typically do feel pain. But when they feel it, all they do is they go into that uh, contempt mode, they go into the you owe me mode, or they go into the I'll show you mode. That's what they do. And so, yes, they feel pain. Um, but then what they do is they make you responsible for making it go away and they don't introspect because that's just not in them to do so. Do you feel pain? The answer is, of course you do. Are you the kind of person that introspects and asks, how do I uh, take the experiences that I've had and make myself a better person because of it? When that's the case, then you know that you're quite distinct from the narcissist. By, by the way, as an aside, uh, I do get some people that are so they, they've been victimized, sure enough, by a strongly narcissistic person or several narcissistic people. But then over time, you realize and, and they don't let go of their victim status. We each have been victimized by someone, but at some point it's a matter of saying, okay, it happened. And I, I'm very sorry that it happened, but I, I don't want that to be the, the prime ingredient in my personal identity. And there are some individuals that uh, it doesn't take much time at all. They'll say, well, let me tell you about the misery that this person in my life has generated. It's like, well, we've already talked about that. And, and it's not that it's as though you're never supposed to speak about it. But at some point, you realize, but I'm more than just my pain. Uh, narcissists, they blame. Uh, and then the, uh, the more passive aggressive person that says, well, I'm just going to make everybody else pay because of the pain I've had. Uh, those are the kind of folks that don't respond well. At some point, you take the pain and then you, uh, you listen to, to the message that it's saying and you make your adjustments accordingly. Okay. Um, this is this next one is an interesting question here. Um, this person is seeing through uh, the narcissist. In other words, they see their true colors now, and they're trying to make sense of this. You know what's going on here. Uh, this person asked the question: Can you explain this? My narcissistic friend in quotation marks can never graciously receive anything. She either has to judge the item or the action and then demeaned and or state emphatically that she doesn't owe me any thanks uh, because the great kindness showed to her. Uh, how does this, uh, how does that kind of uh, behavior fit in with to the rest of this mess? So here she has a person that says, well, if you do something nice, I, I, they feel awkward. You know, it's like, I don't need to give them thanks. Um, why? And, and when somebody's kind and uh, shows favors and, and uh, does some things out of the ordinary, this uh, this narcissistic person's like, what, what, what do you want, a medal? And they can get sarcastic. What's going on there? Um, I, I find that being a help E can sometimes require its own form of humility 
Uh, you know, we like to think of ourselves as being a helper, but uh, many times the helper is the one that's in the control position. Here's what I can do for you. The helpee is in the vulnerable position. It's like, well, if I say, you know, I really could use the help or uh, it's really nice when somebody uh, does something and, and doesn't expect anything in return. Uh, narcissists are in such a competitive mindset. They have to always be on the one upside. And as a result, they, they don't want to say, I have needs. I, I, let me give you a simple illustration. Uh, this is a personal illustration. Uh, a number of years ago, like in my 20s, I had a broken leg and I had a friend and I, I was in a new house and I had a friend who lived in an apartment. And uh, one of the things he said was, well, Les, uh, when you have a broken leg, it's kind of hard to mow the grass. So uh, I live in an apartment. I've always enjoyed doing housework or yard work. Uh, let me come mow your yard for you uh, while you're healing. And I, I told him, no, I, I'll, I'll get this kid down the street and uh, let him do it. He said, no, I really like, um, uh, I like doing yard work. So uh, let me help you out. I said, no, nah, I don't want to put you out. And he just looked at me and said, I want your garage door up. I want the, your lawnmower to have gas in it. I'll be there at nine o'clock on the Saturday morning. I will be there. <laughs> and I realized I would have been doing him a disservice by not letting him help me. It required a humility on my part because frankly, I needed the help. Uh, but at the same time, I was doing him a favor by saying, well, thank you so much. And it was a form of helpfulness on my part toward him to say, I'd like to let you love me because I know that I'd want to do the same thing toward you. Narcissists, they don't think like that. It's like, yeah, if I let you help me, then now I'm going to owe you something. And that's what this uh, uh, person in the, the asking the question was picking up on. Why is this person so unwilling to say, sure, I'll be glad for you to assist me. And it's because it requires them to get off of their superior position. Uh, they're no longer the authoritarian. They're no longer the one that's in control. It's like, yeah, I, I just have to acknowledge my humanity. You're going to see it. And narcissists are like, no, we don't do that. It's like, well, it's there anyway. Okay. Okay, now this, this next person asked a question about boundaries, and it's, it's another fairly common kind of question, but the way they ask it is interesting. This person asked, how do we strongly make boundaries if they're just presented as optional? I tell abusers they must stop harming me, and it's not like they listen, uh, yet I'm not soft on the violence and abuse that needs to stop. Okay. So this person is implying, uh, uh, Carter, it may be that the way that you talk about boundaries, you talk about it as if it's an option. And uh, I don't think it's an option. You just need to make them pay attention to you. You need to make them go along with you. And I understand where they're coming from. Uh, nobody wants to be on the receiving end of abuse and harm. And, and uh, you know, it says this, this I want to tell the abusers, you've got to stop harming me. But here's my beginning point, and that is I can't control another person. And I don't want to set my boundaries and say, here's what you have to know about me. And then wait for them to say, oh, well, now that you put it that way, I guess I'll go along with you. What if they don't? And so boundaries for them is optional. Uh, for example, you may have been exposed to somebody in, in a, a family environment and then they spoke insults to you and uh, you thought, you know, I've talked with you about this insulting style of communication that you've had. I thought I was pretty clear about it and yet you're still doing it. What do I need to do to establish my boundaries so you'll quit doing it? Well, it's still an option. They're free. They can say, yes, I'll respect your boundaries. No, I will not respect your boundaries. They can do that. So the question is, when you set boundaries with others, with that narcissistic person, who are you doing it for? And if you're doing it so that person will see the light, good luck. Uh, keep in mind, you see their true colors, which is why you're establishing boundaries. But what if that person says, I don't have those true colors. I don't, I don't agree with your assessment of me whatsoever. Boundaries is for me. 
My, and when I set a boundary with somebody and I say, well, here's what I will go along with and here's what I will not go along with, I'm acknowledging they have an option. They, they have choices. They can coordinate with me or they cannot. And if they coordinate with me, then we can move forward and we can actually grow and learn and, and adjust. But if I establish my boundary and I'll say, here's what I'm not able to, or I'm not willing to put up with, and that narcissist says, well, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm going to do. I don't really feel the need to come up with another angle to try to make them see the light or explain it a different way so that maybe it'll sound more realistic. It's like, okay, that's your option. You can be that way. I'm going to go ahead and stick with my boundary because I'm doing this for my own self-preservation. I'm doing this for my own uh, healthiness. And if it means that you have to remove yourself from that situation, or if you have to cease uh, 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 interacting with them in certain kinds of ways, that's part of your boundary. If you uh, uh, define yourself as being somebody that has certain priorities or preferences, you follow through on it, whether they approve of that or not, because this is not about them. This is about me taking care of me. That's what boundaries is. And so uh, healthy boundaries and alongside of that healthy assertiveness is not contingent upon that other person saying, okay, I'm, I'm in with you. Uh, because with narcissists, they're not. So they have their choices. It, it is an option for them. But then for you, it might be, well, I've, I've decided uh, I've run out of options and this is what I'm going to do and, uh, and I'm going to stick with it. So make sure that you know why you're setting the boundary and especially who you're setting the boundary for, uh, knowing full well that the narcissist may never go along with you. Okay. Uh, okay. Now, this next person uh, asked a question. It's very basic, but I appreciate the question. And uh, this person, uh, this is a guy that asked me the question I, I had spoken about. You need to have a sense of respect for yourself. This person asked, well, what does respecting oneself look like? Okay. And so, okay, that, that's, a, uh, that's a, a very straightforward kind of question. Here you are, you're in a, a type of recovery mode. You realize that narcissist in front of me is not going to be the kind of person that I thought they might originally be. And now I'm in the mode of trying to rebuild. And part of it is I need to recoup my sense of self-respect. Uh, by the way, uh, I, I did a video, if, if, if you haven't seen it, it's the, 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 something to the effect of recovering your worth after leaving a narcissist. It's one of my favorite videos. Uh, but at, at some point you decide, you know, if the narcissist chooses to disrespect me, that's on them, but I respect me. So what does that mean? Well, first, what it means is you acknowledge that you have an inborn worth. It's something that's not negotiable. Uh, you're, you're valuable. You have your own, uh, good way of thinking. You have your own insights. You get to be responsible for who you are. And when you have self-respect, you say true to all of that. That's what I believe. And then when you ask, well, what does it look like? Well, what it means then is rather than trying to filter your determination and your uh, decisions and your uh, standards and beliefs through everybody else. Well, are they going to get mad at me? Are they going to uh, approve or not approve? You, you go ahead and live into uh, what your own self-worth is. As a simple example, let's suppose that you've decided here's how I'm going to spend my Saturday. And the, the, the disrespecting person says, you come up with all sorts of stupid ideas, don't you? Okay. They don't respect you. Well, what does self-respect look like? Well, self-respect looks like, well, you don't, you may not agree with what I want to do on Saturday, but it makes sense to me. It's something that I enjoy doing. I'm going to do it. And when they say, well, I don't know why you would do that. It's like, yeah, you keep illustrating that you don't know why, but I'm going to do it anyway. And so you follow through and you, uh, you learn to trust yourself and you, uh, you, you uh, take your initiatives without having to give excessive uh, explanations or defense or rationalizations. That's what self-respect looks like. Okay. All right. Now we have more questions, but we, uh, we have more questions than we do time. I'm hoping you can see that sure enough, the more you understand this whole pattern of narcissism, you really will see through somebody's colors. Uh, you'll see the true colors behind the veneer that they have. And you'll be able to say, you know, what you're doing now, maybe in the past, I used to go along with it, but I'm not going along with it anymore. Uh, and part of your recovery is to say, uh, I'm going to trust who I am. 
and I'm going to get a definition for who I'm going to be. And I'm constantly in a learning mode. What have I learned because of my exposure to this person? And then I'm hoping you can have that much stronger of a resolve that says I'm on team healthy. I stand for dignity, respect, and civility. And when the narcissist says, well, I don't agree with you, or you're an idiot, or you're a poser, or you're whatever, then my response to that person is going to be, you may have any interpretation you want. But that's who I'm going to be anyway. That's part. That's so much part of the recovery process. You leaning into your own healthiness, knowing that you don't have to have the stamp of approval from somebody who's a pretty unhealthy person themselves. Okay. So uh, those of you who are new, go ahead and, and uh, put your questions below in the comments section. I want to hear more from you. And then next week, we're going to pick up on midweek with Dr. C. And uh, I, I, I really like this format. I like hearing from you because it allows me to know more um, cleanly who you are and why you're here on the channel and how we can encourage and support you. So send in the questions and it lets me know you and then allows me to respond in ways that are a little bit different than what I would say in uh, my videos and now my podcast. And we're just going to keep this going until we run out of questions, which may be a while. Okay. All right, Team Healthy. I want you to have a good rest of the week. Stay strong and, uh, and trust yourself. I'll see you next time. Bye.